so so now we're going to get into um, value and monetary value and you know we were talking about the tea bowl and the Mona Lisa having cultural value um, but of course the Mona Lisa is worth quite a, a fair amount of money um, also Titian we're gonna look at and this artwork it, it talks a little bit in the book about how no one really ever saw this work because it was made for Isabella de Este herself and then she had it in her home and very few people saw it so I'm going to back up for a second. A few things about this painting is that this she is a patron, much like the Medici's. She's a very powerful paint, uh, person, and also um, she is shown here in her youth, and this was really actually painted when she was a uh, older woman in her 60s, but it's idealized to honor her, and you can kind of see how intense she is um, <clears throat> in this painting. So. At any rate, Titian's work now is worth multiple million dollars, millions of dollars, but at the time he sold directly, you know, to someone like Isabella de Este, and didn't make a ton of money because he <clears throat> had a patron and he was supported and made works for the church and for um, patrons. So you got to remember, um, there wasn't the art world that there is today. There were different things like the guilds and the academies. Now, guilds are kind of like when we were talking about um, Jeff Koons, where their people are making the work uh, for the main artists. They're training. Usually, it's a traditional, you know, type of painting or a traditional type of sculpture, and they're learning the technique and they're learning the style as well. Okay, so this is going to bring us to. Um, a really beautiful piece by Gustav Klimt, Adele Blockbauer uh, the second, and this is from 1912. Now this is a piece of art that was taken by the Nazis. Um, Hitler really, if you don't know this about history, um, and there's a lot of times that World War II, World War I also comes into our story of art quite a bit. But at any rate, Hitler was a frustrated artist. Uh, no one liked his painting. They're very strange. Um, you can always Google that and look at his weird paintings. People looked really weird. I don't think he ever really had a regard for humanity. At any rate, he thought, you know, far in the future, he had this hundred year plan and a five year plan and a bunch of other things, but he was building this ideal city not unlike Athens, you know, and the Acropolis and things like that where he would have all this artwork. So Basically, anybody who uh, was of the Jewish faith, as you know, was um, put into a camp, and if they were wealthy, and they had jewelry or artwork or anything at all, they would, that was taken. But particularly, the artwork was placed in different caves and hidden away. So the Nazis took a lot of art, and this is one of the rare examples of a piece of art that resurfaced. And I don't remember the whole story. This was in... Um, early 2000s but it came on um, came up for sale and the family was still living and had the paperwork to confirm it and I think a photograph not only of the woman it depicts but of her in front of the actual painting so that really helped establish the what we call provenance uh, ownership or you know who originally had it and who sold it and like that um, so really interesting story and it sold for 87 Point nine million dollars, quite a fair sum. Um, it really uh, was a clumped piece; it never sold for that much. But when something has gone away and not been seen, the value increases in this way. Some of the Nazi works were destroyed, unfortunately, um, and perhaps there's more of them to be found. We don't know. But then, in terms of monetary value, um, things like that, the theft of it or disappearance and recovery of it. Um, will sometimes change the value. And there's a little story in the book as well about this. Um, Rembrandt, self-portrait, same same kind of thing. I'll let you read that, but that was stolen and recovered. Then we get into Mark Quinn's self. Now, this is a really wild piece, and I heard a story, and I don't even know if it's true, um, that when he was making these... Um, somebody uh, cleaning a house unplugged the freezer because this is frozen blood is what this is and it's in a refrigerator and you cannot unplug the refrigerator and let it melt <laughs> because it's going to be destroyed and a cleaning person or there was a power outage I'm not sure unplugged the fridge and uh, it, it melted 
At any rate, these are self-portraits. And he also does this, I believe, as commissions for other people, uh, for their own portraits of themselves. But he takes pints and pints of his own blood over a period of time, so he's not, you know, uh, ill. And then he casts um, a, a likeness of himself. It's a little bit of a chronological story he's doing it every five years i believe and he is sort of changing you know how his face is changing his hair and all like that um but it's kind of an interesting concept blood is something we fear and it's life-giving and it's also frightening to us so they're quite powerful if you think about um these pieces made out of blood and these are quite valuable as well Okay, so Vermeer, um, this, there's a blurb on this about how 